Here's the invitation for today. It's magnificent. God, who will come into my life today that you can help me make feel that they are truly special? Such a powerful thing with people to communicate to them, you are someone of worth. You are worth knowing. You are worth observing. I believe in you. I value you. Even for a brief moment, you are special. Now, I know that word can sound a little Mr. Rogerish. But Mr. Rogers was himself a Presbyterian minister, and he used it to try to convey that sense of wonder that this person is made in the image of God, and Jesus died for them. And all of that can be present all the time in my mind as I encounter people, as opposed to all other kind of much less noble thoughts. How useful is this person, or how attractive do they look, or how important do they seem to be? We're talking about being renewed from the inside, Renovation of the Heart, this book by Dallas Willard. And we've been looking at how God wants to renew our minds, and that is where our lives begin. And he says on page 110, there are some dangers in our thought life with God. The first one, he says, is pride and overconfidence in ideas, images, or bits of information just because they're ours or just because they're mine. And how often do those of us in the church, especially those of us who teach, end up being guilty about this? So I don't look at what I really believe to see if it's true. That leads to a second danger, simple ignorance of fact. And often people end up becoming uh, followers of Jesus. I think of my friend Lee Strobel who didn't believe in him because they actually just take seriously investigating what might be true. But of course, those of us who are people of faith can end up stop being open to truth, just being relaxed and confident that if I follow the truth, it'll lead me to Jesus. A third great danger in thought life, especially of those who try to follow Jesus, is allowing our desires to guide our thinking, especially the desire to prove that we are right. Dallas says we should make it a rule never to try merely to prove that we are right. That would make a great difference in a lot of lives. And then the fourth and final great danger has to do with, hey Mark, has to do with the um, images that we admit into our minds. These may be images of intellectual authority, images of financial well-being, uh, images of power, images of sexuality. Um, But he says, if we allow everything access to our mind, we are simply asking to be kept in a state of mental turmoil or bondage. And then this, for nothing enters the mind without having an effect for good or evil. Now that is a thought of profound significance that you do not often hear in our culture, in the media, online, in entertainment. Nothing that we allow into our mind enters without some impact for good or evil. So the thought for today is, God, who's going to come into my life where I can make them feel special? What can I do? How can you help me with this? And I'll tell you where this is coming from. There's a book by Arthur Brooks I've been reading called From Strength to Strength. It tells a very poignant story about a woman who was tremendously successful on Wall Street, made a fortune, was highly respected, but there was an image in her mind that was damaging her life. Arthur writes, "Uh, Lately she started missing a step here or there. Her decisions as a manager were not as crisp as they were, her instincts becoming less reliable. Where once she commanded the room, now she sees younger colleagues doubt her, In a panic about the prospect of decline, she had been reading about my research. He talks about in his book, uh, the ways in which we decline and the ways in which we can flourish in the second half of life. And she reached out to me. I asked her a lot of questions about her life. She was not happy, had not been happy for many years, maybe ever. Her marriage was unsatisfactory. She drank a little too much. Relationship with the college-age kids was all right, but distant. She had few real friends. She worked incredibly long hours, felt physically exhausted a lot of the times. Her work was everything. She lived to work, but she was afraid that was starting to slip. She openly admitted these things, 
And Arthur writes, you would think that the solution to her problem would be obvious. And so he suggested that stuff to her. You need to redirect your time. You need to build into this marriage that is really in danger. You need to spend some time investing in your children so that they feel close to you. You need to get some help with your drinking. You need to become a rested person. He said, uh, I know that your grueling work effort made you successful in the first place, but now that it's making you miserable, you got to find a way to fix it, right? You might love bread, but if you become gluten intolerant, you stop eating because it makes you sick. And then here's the sentence. She thought about my question for a couple of minutes. Finally, she looked at me and said, matter of factly, maybe I would prefer to be special rather than happy. Maybe I would prefer to be special rather than happy. Now, I was thinking, reading this little section of Isaiah chapter 55, verse 2, where the prophet says, Why do you spend your money on what is not bread, your labor on what cannot satisfy you? If my make my life about being special, and I understand that appeal, I understand that idol, I get it. Then being special at its core means being more special than others more smart or more successful or more pretty or more strong or more wealthy. And if other people become more, then I become a little less. I'm only special if I'm different other than better than. And so I actually have an interest in uh, inhibiting the specialness of others. I will go on a crusade actually where I will be threatened if others become more special and that keeps others distance from me. And because I am made to love God and love people, pursuing specialness as a way of getting happy actually becomes a, a way to ensure that I will never be genuinely happy. Arthur goes on, looking at my astonished face, she explained, anybody can do the things it takes to be happy go on vacation, spend time with friends and family. But not everyone can accomplish great things. Arthur writes, I initially scoffed at this, but then I thought about it in the privacy of my own mind. I realized I also have made this choice at points in my life, maybe even most of the time, if I'm honest. The financier had spent many years creating a version of herself that others would admire, including some who were dead, like her parents. More importantly, her curated self was a person she would admire. Hugely successful. Isn't that special, as the church lady used to say? She succeeded. But nothing's permanent. And now she felt like every hour of work was giving her, uh, giving her less than the last. And not just less happiness, less power, less prestige too. Her problem was that the special one she had created was less than a full person. She had traded herself for a symbol of herself, you might say. There is my curated self, the self that I want other people to think that I am, the self that I want to think that I am, and then my real self. Would I rather be special than happy? Arthur writes about how it reminded him of something that a friend of his said who had struggled with an addiction for a real long time and uh, was miserable. And Arthur asked him, why did you uh, not do whatever it took to overcome that addiction when you were miserable? And his comment was, I would rather be high than happy. And of course, uh, there are many forms of addiction, one of which is workaholism, Wayne Oates coined the phrase workaholism back in the 60s. He was a psychologist and he did it when his own son made an appointment in his office to see his dad. When your child is making an appointment to come see you, you're a little bit too busy. And work itself, uh, like anything else in our lives, when we ultimize it, uh, can become an idol, can become an addiction. So here's the great question of this day. Have I been making my life about being special rather than about being happy? And if that's what I want, then the way that I pursue that is by looking at the people in my life and seeing, can I make them feel special? What can I bring to them? I was this last weekend at a church called Crossings in Oklahoma, 
And I was sitting at their staff meeting a couple days after that, sitting next to their lead pastor, Marty Grubbs. And he loves his work, but mostly what he loves about it is the people that he works with. And one person after another would get up at the room in front of their all staff meeting and Marty would say, oh my goodness, this person's story is amazing. Wow, this person's gift to help other people or to encourage or to do worship or music. You would not believe that. And it was just like watching somebody whose joy at work was making other people feel special. And now, of course, you'll run into some people who are not that way. But everybody is complex and everybody fights a battle. I was talking to my friend Chuck just a couple of minutes ago, and he was telling me about somebody he has been reading who's a real gifted writer, but Chuck met once and was kind of a miserable human being. And I was saying, you know, it raises this very deep question. Is it the case that some people are able to communicate really, really well, but they're just jerks in real life, just bad people? Or is it that people are really kind of complex and maybe some people are, are crusty or distant on the outside, but inside there's wisdom and warmth and compassion? And Chuck said, oh, that's easy. It's the former. Uh, they're just jerks. Glad I could solve that question for you. What else do you want to know? But I kind of think Chuck was joking. I kind of think everybody you and I know carries wounds and battles and scars that are not seeable on the, on the surface. And so today, God, would you come into my mind? God, you would, would you fill my mind with thoughts other than just how can I try to make myself more special today? God, would you deliver me from my curated self? Who will I see today when I go to get a cup of coffee, when I go into the doctor's office, when I work, when I look at my family, when I, uh, uh, spool up on Zoom, whatever the right verb is for Zooming. Who can I look at and see your image in today and speak words of encouragement and love and warmth and compassion? In the least saccharine way I know how to say it, you are very special. And God wants to use what is special about you to bring life to others. That's a renewed mind. See you next time. Thanks for joining us. There are emails that go along with each episode. And if you'd like to receive those, you can go to becomenew.me slash subscribe. And there you can also sign up to receive daily text alerts. We'll see you next time.